Namaskaram to everyone. Well, uh, why this Youth and Truth, how it came about? In the last uh, thirty, thirty-five years that I've been active with people, this has been a constant refrain. Thousands of people ask me this question, Sadhguru, where were you when I was twenty? You have come when I'm sixty. If you had come when I was twenty, I would have lived like this, I would have done this, I would have done that. I've been hearing this continuously, so I decided we'll step out and meet all those people who are below twenty-five in this country and also outside. That's why this youth and truth, this effort is… See, what we call as life essentially is a, a combination of certain amount of time and a certain amount of energy. Time is passing for all of us at the same pace. If we sit, it passes, if we stand, it passes, if we do something, it passes, if we laze around, it'll pass, awake, asleep, time is rolling for all of us. Only thing we can really manage is our energies. When you are youth, when you are in that segment of life which is called youth, you are at the peak of your energy. This is something most of the youth will not realize till it passes. <laughs> that you are at the peak of your energy, life is not going to be the same way as years roll. So when this energy is at its peak, which is the only manageable part of our life. Time is not manageable, it just rolls. This is the only manageable part of our life. When it is raging at its peak, if only if we bring a certain level of clarity and balance in our life, this energy could become a phenomenal force in our life. This energy could become a possibility to unfold our genius, when I say our genius, every individual has a certain genius within them. Will they find the necessary atmosphere, necessary attitude, necessary situation within themselves and around themselves to unfold this or not is the only question. Unfortunately, I could be wrong with my percentages, but unfortunately I think not even one percent of the human population manage to really let their genius blossom in their life because they all get concerned with their livelihoods and other stuff. Very few people remain unconcerned and explore the possibility of what can be done at its peak within themselves and around themselves. So it is only one percent. My endeavor is in this generation, if we can raise this to ten percent, we will have a brilliant world, we will have a phenomenal process happening in the world because after all, the nation, the world, the society are the products of human genius. Whether we live as a mediocre society or as a brilliant society is not decided by the masses on the street, but a few brilliant minds which come. If we increase the number and percentage of those brilliance, that brilliance to unfold in a society, that society will rage and flourish in a different way. In this culture, that's always been the focus. Always individual genius has been the focus because ultimately that is the determining factor. That is why we are in the universities seeing how to assist you in this process, not just learning engineering or technology, but how to unfold the greatest technology that we already have, which is human mechanism. Thank you very much for having us here. Good evening, everybody. I, I welcome you all here to the Youth and Truth program at IIT Bombay. First of all, I would like to thank Mohit Chauhan, sir, for his splendid performance. He has infused so much energy in the audience here. A round of applause for him. I would also like to thank Isha Sanskriti and Sounds of Isha for their amazing display of raw talent. Uh, it has been mesmerizing. Yeah. Um, uh, my name is Syed Saklin. I'm a PhD student, first year chemical engineering. Um, Sadhguru, let me just say, we are honored and blessed to have you here in our presence. Um, now. now, without further ado... It's a, it's a privilege for a 
uneducated man to be in an educational <laughs> institution, so… <laughs> it's perceptive <laughs> I didn't go there at the right time, so now I'm coming <laughs> So yeah, without further ado, I would like to commence this conversation with your permission. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, very often in lives, we come across crossroads where we are compelled to choose between two options which were equally pleasing. For instance, I just graduated my B.Tech this year and I had a few options. I had uh, options to do MS in Cornell and Johns Hopkins University abroad or to do a PhD here at IIT Bombay. My heart was leading me towards the US lifestyle, but my brain told me that this is the right thing, a PhD at IIT Bombay is the right thing for my career. But every time, I'm evidently I'm here at IIT Bombay, but uh, every night when I go to sleep, I, 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 fas uh, I fantasize and I think about how my life in the US would have been, how, you know, I wonder how it would have been. So when, 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 when I'm at such a stage, what, uh, could, you, could, you, could you tell me what, what exactly this uh, conflict of interest is? What should I be doing? <laughs> <laughs> See, we must understand this. People are always thinking when it comes to education, career, choice of partners, marriage, at various points, what is the best thing to do? Let me tell you, there is no best thing to do in the world. <laughs> really there's no best thing to do. Even if you take a very simple thing and put everything that you have into it, if you throw yourself into it, it could become a great thing. Is it the best thing? No. There is no best thing, because how do you decide what is best? What I'm doing is best or what you're doing is best, there's no such thing. Is spiritual process the best thing or chemical engineering the best thing? It'll be foolish even to ask that question, isn't it? It is just that if you throw your life into something, it can become a great thing. So don't look for best things because you'll waste your life always wondering what's the best thing. People come to me, they've been married for thirty-five years, have three, four children. Sadhguru, I don't know if I made the right choice <laughs> I said, well, it looks like you've been not been thinking, you've been acting, four children <laughs> So till the end of your life, you can go on thinking, what is the best thing, what is the best thing? There is no best thing. Whatever we put our heart and soul into and do it, it's a great thing. It may be a simple thing in somebody else's eyes, but in our experience it's a great thing and that's what we should do. Uh, hello everybody. Namaskaram Sadhguru. Uh, my name is Hia and uh, I'm a first year student here studying in the aerospace department. Mm. Being a college student, we live in dorms and hostels and we're surrounded by people day in and day out. And with people comes opinions and ideas. So for instance, let's say I got, I got up in the morning and I got ready for class and I'm about to leave and one of my friends joins me and she casually comments that your hair doesn't look very good today, like what's wrong with it? So some of us are of the type that we will rush back to our rooms and just fix it somehow might mean, that, that might even mean that we are late for class. Uh, but let's say I didn't even do that, let's say I didn't even do that. But that thing would keep going in my mind, like throughout. I would be in the class but I will be thinking about my hair. So it is <laughs> others' opinions and ideas have a very deep effect, although, although it varies from person to person, the amount of effect it has. But how do we take the good out of it and still not lose our individuality and uh, uniqueness in the process? <laughs> now, <laughs> in this world, uh, more money, probably ten times or even hundred times more money is being spent on hair products <laughs> than on the brain products. <laughs> So it looks like a whole lot of people don't care what is inside, they only care what is outside. So uh, for those people who are in a certain state of their life where they need to intensely focus on something, very intensely, where they need undivided attention to achieve what they want to achieve, 
normally we shave their heads, you know, <laughs> so that they don't have to stand in front of the mirror every day. See, I don't have to stand in front of the mirror, every day I look the same. So I don't have to check how am I looking today. So when you're focused on something else, certain things get less significance. How we look, is it important? Yes, it is. To some extent, it is important in our lives. But right now, you're not going to walk the ramp, you're going to the class, okay? <laughs> so all you have to do is bundle up your hair, tie it up on top of your head so that they can't see your hair, they can just see the knot and they can see the size of your head, that's a good thing <laughs> It is not that one should not be concerned about their appearance, of course it matters, but where does it matter, where does it not matter is something we have to decide. If it matters too much everywhere, I've seen people uh, about twenty-seven times in a minute, they do If you're adjusting your hair half the time in your life, what the hell are you going to do of any significance? <laughs> I'm not saying you should not have hair, I'm not saying you should not keep it well, but if you are so concerned about your appearance, obviously you're a bit empty inside. There's some more stuff within you. You wouldn't be so concerned about your appearance. Taking care of our appearance to a certain extent is important. Well, if you're going into the films or you're a model or something, you have to take care of it much more, maybe. But for an engineer, if you're presentable, it's fine, huh? And the, um, <laughs> it's not… it doesn't uh, end at the appearances. It's about the general opinions of life and about ourselves. Let's say anything about us that they have, that people have, they somehow… Whatever kind of opinions? Maybe behavioral traits, like somebody tells me, uh, you speak very loudly, maybe. Hmm? You speak very loudly all the time, why do you mm -hmm. do that? Maybe, I mean, <laughs> it hasn't happened with me, I'm just giving an example. So, how do we take, like, it's a very casual I was about to tell casual you casual your command. trousers are torn, but I didn't tell you <laughs> <laughs> There was a time when I lived in denims, nothing but denims, okay? Only Levi's. And because of motorcycling and all kinds of things, they would get torn. We had to get it from United States, otherwise they were locally not available in sixties. So we used to patch it up, but now people are tearing it up and then wearing it. <laughs> so obviously, obviously the message is you don't care a hoot what other people think about you. Let that come into every aspect of your life, you don't really care what other people saying about it <laughs> That's the idea, isn't it? The idea of tearing up a new pant and walking is, you don't really care, but that's not the truth with a whole lot, whole lot of people. How is it toned? Your pant is toned better than mine <laughs> So we've gotten into this mess essentially because we have not delved into what this is. There is no profound experience of yourself. Who you are is a bundle of opinions that other people have given. You are… if ten people say you are good, you will become very good, it's like this. You went outside, somebody told you, oh, you are the most wonderful person on this planet. Then you are uh, floating on cloud number what? Nine. Only nine, huh? In Tamil Nadu, we do eleven. <laughs> so you are floating on cloud number whatever, and you came home, they told you who you really are and suddenly it'll crash the cloud. Tch. Floating on a cloud is not a wise thing, you're bound to crash, isn't it? Hello? Floating on a cloud is not a safe thing to do, you are bound to crash. So, whatever this floating on cloud number whatever is not a good thing because somebody blows you up. I must tell you this, if you have to settle this within yourself, one important thing is, this happened to me in a certain way. <laughs> uh, my daughter started traveling with me when she was three and a half months old, alone. So I'm driving my little Maruti all over the country, this is the time when I'm building Isha Foundation. And uh, my right leg is always heavy. 
So I keep one hand on this little baby and drive full on on the highways <laughs> going from town to town, various programs and stuff. So she grew up in many people's homes, every… every week she's a new home. I made one rule to all of them, never teach the girl anything. You're not going to teach her ABC, you're not going to teach her one, two, three, you're not going to teach her Mary had a little lamb, because I don't care whether Mary had a lamb or not. <laughs> nobody teach her anything. So, because nobody is teaching her anything, she's uh, all eyes and ears. By the time she's eighteen months, she's speaking three languages very fluently. Nobody taught her anything. I said, no rhymes, no one, two, three, no ABC, nothing. She grew up like this and I wouldn't have sent her to school, but my schedules were crazy. Plus, no company of that age group around, she's the only girl. So I put her into school. When she was around twelve, one day she came home little disturbed because of what happened at the school. And she said, you're teaching so many things to everybody, you're not teaching me anything. I said, well, I am not known to do these things unsolicited. Now that you've come, we could try something. I said, see, this is all you need to know. You never look down on anybody, nor do you ever look up at anybody. Then she looked at me like this, what about you kind of thing. I said, see, if you look up to me, you will miss me completely. If you look up to me, what will you do? You'll take my picture and nail it into the wall. You will miss who I am. The value of who I am will be completely missed if you look up to me. You have to just look at me for what I am, for everything that I do, not look up to me. If you look up to me, you know, <laughs> nailing is all that will happen. So this is a simple thing, never look down on anybody, never look up to anybody. As simple as it sounds, this means you have no judgment in your head as to what is good, what is bad, what is high, what is low, what is virtue, what is sin. You're willing to look at life just for what it is. If you see life simply for what it is, you will effortlessly navigate through life. All these things will not even be an issue in your life. I am Gaganpreet Singh, pursuing Masters in Geoinformatics and Remote Sensing in CSRE Department at IIT Bombay, sir. Sir, I… <laughs> yeah, what the… I'm sure this guy is popular out here, right? <laughs> Sadhguru, I belong to land of five rivers and now wherever I go there, for all the ab able people I see, Everyone dreams of going to land of maple leaf right now, that we call it Canada. <laughs> and when I interact with them, they have the one motive, we'll go there, we will earn in dollars and send back and build, adopt one of the village, build roads, all hospitals, schools, what is harm in it? Then I see soldiers, farmers, social activists, teachers who are working at grassroots level. So if I get opportunity, because in IIT, we'll, we will get some good opportunity to go abroad and earn Canadian dollars or work here and whatever we can contribute in the tax, that is quite minuscule as compared to the funding which we get from abroad. Which route should I take? Oh. <laughs> Say, uh, India is an ancient culture. An ancient culture means there are many benefits because there is immense wisdom and there is also a heap of bullshit. <laughs> to sift through this bull and get to the wisdom takes uh, some effort. <laughs> uh, the five rivers are in a pathetic state, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and. Uh, the land has been ripped through completely. So naturally people want to go elsewhere and do the same, to another continent. Well, Punjab was an important part of the Green Revolution in this country, that's very wonderful. But at the same time, 
this green revolution became relevant in our country simply because we were in a desperate state. We had every three to four years bad famines where sometimes millions of people died in the last century. But the last famine we have had is probably 1962 or three. After that, we have not had a famine, we have had droughts, bad agricultural years, but no famines, no mass deaths at least. So it's fantastic. But these were desperate measures what we took because to beat that situation. So we exploited the land in a certain way, which is not healthy long term, but we did it because it was kind of emergency for the nation. So now, uh, should I go abroad and send uh, Canadian dollars? I'm not saying you should not go abroad. If you think you're going to learn something better there, acquire some more skills, then you can gather here. If there are possibilities, or even if you're going to work there, but don't think in terms of you'll earn dollars, then come back and build your village. That's a long shot. Actually, what we need in this country is not necessarily dollars. What we need in this country is uh, a corruption-free, clear, focused and dedicated people. That's what we're missing. <clears throat> money is there. We don't really need money from outside, really. It is just that we are constantly busy working against each other at so many levels, <laughs> okay? Our energies are simply spent throwing things at each other all the time. If I… if you don't understand what I'm saying, just turn on one of the English news channels and watch in the evening. How much energy is simply wasted, simply saying rubbish against each other endlessly? <laughs> and slowly we are losing all sense of civilization in this argument. We, <laughs> we think we are debating. No, we are just shouting abuses at each other and think we are debating. A debate means to explore, to use two brains instead of one to explore something. That is a debate. Not simply throwing things at each other is not debate. We can as well, th as well throw stones at each other. Instead of hurling abuses, at least it will end soon <laughs> So this is going on, immense waste of energy, no cleanliness. When I say no cleanliness, mm, I mean a whole lot of people are simply innocent of integrity. They're not corrupt, they're just innocent of integrity, they don't know what it is. Because we are a nation who are not controlled by any moral code, nobody told us, thou shall not do this or that. Nobody told us. But in this culture, we managed ourselves by constantly stirring up human consciousness in every generation. Well, you also come from the land of gurus, because the idea is to stir up human consciousness rather than give you a set of morals that to follow. Because morals can be subverted by anybody. But when it arises within you, it's a natural expression of who you are. So this has been the process. But over a period of time, because of invasions and occupations, this system of transmitting consciousness or invigorating human consciousness, those systems have largely collapsed. Today anybody can read uh, half a book which is considered sacred, can become a guru and do whatever they want, all right? You have a lot of them in land of five rivers. <laughs> because this system has collapsed, people have not invested their life into knowing something. They're just reading half a book and trying to preach. Reading book and preaching was significant when everybody else was illiterate. Now that literacy has grown, you read a book and tell somebody, it doesn't mean a damn thing, they can read it themselves. So this is going to be become irrelevant even in a school and college in the coming years as technology develops. 
reading a textbook and telling them what it is all about will become irrelevant in the next ten, fifteen years. So similarly, reading scriptures and telling people what it is has already become pretty irrelevant because everybody can read and understand better than the preacher, most probably. So this process of what shall I do, should I go there and send dollars, if you are going there to pursue something, it is fine. If you think there is some form of uh, skill or education or knowledge or even a profession which is not available here, you want to go there, it is fine. But you are going there to make dollars and send it back, please don't waste your life like that. There is so much to be done here. If you have integrity, <laughs> why I'm focusing on integrity is this has been a scarce thing. I must tell you this, about uh, seven, eight years ago, I was in the United States and somebody told me, Sadhguru, if you type the word spiritual on the net, Every day, over hundred thousand people are typing the word spiritual. I said, is that so? That many people are typing the word spiritual? Because I never typed that word <laughs> I said, type it, let's see what comes. So on the Google, if you type spiritual, first thing that comes up is a spa in Mexico. <laughs> Second thing that comes up is a call girl in Northern California. She has spiritual sex, spiritual whatever, whatever. She knows the SEO, you know. She's used spiritual in twenty-five different places in her website. So if you say spiritual, she comes up. <laughs> then I thought, this is a shame. For thousands of years, anything spiritual means people looked east towards India. So I said, let's open a, a platform as the spiritual gateway to the world, India. So all the spiritual whatever nonsense you have, everybody put their official page on one platform. If they want to put more, they'll have to pay, but one page is free for everybody. If the world types out spiritual, this big site will come. And every form of spirituality is there, people can choose where they want to go. And we thought we will bring some kind of a standard, three things you must do, three things you must not do when people from outside the country come to you. So I, for the first time, I had never met any spiritual leader in the country. I had never seen them, I had never sh shared platforms with them, nor I had visited their ashrams. I never had time for those things, I was just busy with what I was doing. For the first time, I made attempt to meet a lot of people. Well, I met many absolutely wonderful people who are doing great work. But it was also amazing to see that a whole lot of them are completely innocent of integrity. They just don't know what it is. Really, it's incredible. If I walk into an airport or a golf course, I meet better men who don't know anything about spirituality, but they're better men. <laughs> just to give you an example, I am walking in this ashram of theirs, somebody, a big man. As an organization, they're way bigger than us. So I'm walking with him and then I see some nice trees in the ashram. Then I say, you really have some nice trees, big trees. He says, oh, without looking at the trees, ah, that's our Panchavati. I look there, there are only four trees. <laughs> then I said, uh, but there are only four trees there. He said, huh, huh, four, five, huh? You know, this four, five is all Maya. Four, he, he's just… he's just surprised that I'm actually counting four. When he says five, it's five, four and five is all maya, you know. There's only zero and the infinite, in between all is maya <laughs> So, whether it is politics or any profession, including spirituality, Unfortunately, one ingredient that is really weak in India right now is integrity. If you think you have integrity, please stay in India. We don't want one more to escape. <laughs> Sadhguru, I spend lots of time on my phone, it's a ridiculous amounts of time. It, it helps me with my notes, it keeps me updated with my calendar and connected with the entire world. But the, the more we depend on it, the, uh, the more it replaces our menial tasks. 
Now, uh, technological advances are so steep and rapid that it is predicted that uh, one day humanity will pass through a time period called singularity. It is that time period when machines will be intelligent enough to devise machines which are more intelligent than them. And this will happen recursively. So my question here is, do you think that these technological advances which are happening will ultimately cause mankind's doom? Uh, not necessarily. See, uh, you must understand, hundred years ago, how many things we had to do with our body? And today, how many things we have to do with our body has come down ten thousand percent. What do you think? At least. Because everything had to be done using human muscle. Now, uh, if you press a switch, everything will happen. You have seen in uh, all those period movies, two guys will be standing next to a Maharaja and uh, doing the fan. See, all those guys hanging there. No? Like this, so many things. Every time something new came, people felt threatened. Who are doing that panka job, they felt threatened, their jobs will go away. Of course, they found something else now. Nobody is doing panka anymore. Like this, you don't have to worry, you will find something else to do. If… The, it is uh, uncanny that you ask this question because in the last… Uh, last one year, I've been invited to various international conferences to speak about artificial intelligence. I said, why me? I'm a natural intelligence, why are you <laughs> Why are you calling me to speak about artificial intelligence? Their whole thing is, these are all I'm talking about top-level people, scientists and others. Their whole thing is, Sadhguru, if this intelligence unfolds, if artificial… If AI, they're calling it, we think Air India, but <laughs> if this AI unfolds, we will all lose our jobs. I said, how fantastic, find an AI like that for me, so that I lose my job and I'll just live. <laughs> Isn't it fantastic if all of us lose our jobs and we are on a holiday for the rest of our lives? <laughs> Everything we have to do if a machine does it, isn't it great? that human beings can use their intelligence and time for creating something else altogether rather than doing menial jobs on a daily basis. If I ask you to go right now and if I ask you to hold panka for me because there's no fan is not working, is it not a waste of your intelligence? Hello? Huh? Yes. It's good for me but <laughs> is it not a waste of your life in so many ways? So similarly, it's a waste of life right now that most people are thinking how to earn a living, how to earn a living. God damn it, even an earthworm is earning a living, a grasshopper is earning a living, a bird is earning a living, a... every other creature is earning a living. With such a big brain, what is a human being concerned about earning a living? It shouldn't even be a thing. But right now human problem is, it's not about earning a living. You want to earn living like somebody else, then there is no end to your life. <laughs> you want to earn a living for this life, there's really no problem. I want to live like you. Now this is a problem. This is an endless pursuit. This is not going to end at any time. See, the most affluent nations, why does a human being seek affluence? Either an individual or a society, why do we seek affluence? At the first level, it's a choice of nourishment, that you can eat whatever you want. That's the first step of earning money. The next step is a choice of lifestyles. Now countries like United States, you are only going to Canada, huh? <laughs> countries like United States have a choice of nourishment and a choice of lifestyles. But seventy percent of U.S. population is on prescription medication. With such a choice of nourishment and lifestyles, they should have at least, if not the most conscious and wonderful, at least been the healthiest plan uh, uh, population on the planet, isn't it so? Their healthcare bill is three trillion dollars. People estimate by 2030, their healthcare bill could be anywhere around seven to seven point five trillion dollars. Already it is bigger than our economy. 
one thing that can sink that nation is the healthcare bill. So, just affluence is not going to help. So when artificial intelligence comes and does all the things that we want to do, that we are no more concerned about earning a living, every human being on this planet, their living is taken care of, I think human genius will unfold. It's a tremendous possibility. Of course, fools who don't know what to do with themselves, they'll bum around, they'll get drunk, they'll get drugged, they'll lie here and there, but a whole lot of humanity will come to terms with it and fire up in a different way. I think it's great times. We don't really have to worry about your phone. Can I tell you a joke? You okay? Yes, yes, go ahead. Because you look serious, Seth. <laughs> a man came into the office with half his face burnt out. Show me the other side of your face. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, his boss asked, what happened to you? Why is your face burnt up like this? No, no, I just took a call. I attended a call. Said, what? You taking a telephone call will burn your face like this? No, I was ironing my clothes. <laughs> Phone rang. <laughs> so, right now the problem is not technology. Technology is a tremendous enabler. I remember the time when I was building this foundation. Like uh, once in a fortnight or so, I have a telephone call day. When I stop somewhere on the highway, that blue colored tin box, metal box, you've seen them? STD, local, international, whatever is written on that. <laughs> so I get into those things and uh, start making hundreds of calls. But today, if I just tell my phone, it calls. Oh, I'm glad technology is advancing, life has become so much easier and better, but some people don't know how to use it, they're always stuck to it. Many people are getting killed using the phones, hmm? So many people are getting killed. So the problem is not of technology, the problem is of compulsiveness. So many people are getting killed. See, it is still unfortunate there are so many children and people dying because of malnourishment. We have the highest malnourished population in the world. But more people on this planet die because they don't know when to stop eating. Yes, compulsiveness. Food is not the problem, isn't it? Hello? Is food good or good for us or no? Hello? Food is good for us, but if you don't know when to… if you start eating, you don't know when to stop eating. Then it becomes a serious problem. The same goes for the phone. You start using it, but you don't know when to stop using. So the problem is not technology, the problem is not anything in our lives. Fundamentally, we are living an unconscious life. We are living a compulsive life. When you live compulsively, then everything is a problem. There's no one specific thing which is a problem, everything is a problem. All the great Wonderful things that come our way become serious problem in our life simply because we do it compulsively. Sir, um, in the Indian society, uh, when something goes wrong, for let's say someone is not well, so there are three types of people. Ones who go to the hospital, then there are the ones who rush to the temples and then there are the third ones who rush to the astrologers. So, we are uh, actually taught from the beginning that uh, inanimate objects and uh, things around us have the power to control our lives. For example, uh, the… the… this… Um, for example, my mother, when uh, two to three years back, told me to wear a ring which had the gemstones. I still has it on, <laughs> have it on because, of course, because that's what mom has said. So. Oh, you need to take it off, otherwise the boys will think. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> but good luck, you keep it in the pocket. If it's on your finger, they will think you're. <laughs> So that's another issue to it, but <laughs> 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 I really do not understand 
Like how can an inanimate object control so much going on in, in my life or in anybody else's? Or can it really do that, rather? See, uh, human life is made in such a way, particularly human life. For all the animals, nature has fixed clear-cut path, what they can do, what they cannot do. Their lives happen within between two lines. They cannot go below that, they cannot go above that. Within that they live, that's why they look so sure and certain and they're peaceful. Once their stomach is full, they're all peaceful. Do you see this? Hello? Are you on talking terms with me or no one? <laughs> Do you see all the animals, once their stomach is full, they are peaceful. But human beings are thinking or they're being taught that peace is the ultimate goal of life. A buffalo, full stomach, he sits peacefully. And for you, that is the ultimate goal, what a shame. What a buffalo can do with a stomach full of grass or whatever else he eats, you have to hold it as the ultimate goal. Is it not a shame, I'm asking you? But <laughs> this is being thought like this, peace is the ultimate goal of your life. But coming to more fundamentals, if you're not peaceful today, can you enjoy your dinner today? Hmm? No. Can you just enjoy walking down the street? Can you enjoy the company of a few people around you? No. If not ecstatic, at least you must be peaceful to enjoy anything in your life. So I'm asking, should it be the first step in your life or the last step in your life? Such people will only rest in peace <laughs> Now, do other things have influence on us, particularly inanimate objects? the gems and the diamonds and things like that and also the planets. See, the nature of the planet has a certain influence on the life upon it. You will see on full moon days and new moon days, many animals behave in certain specific ways simply because they're influenced by it. You know the whole ocean is rising, hmm? When ocean which is millions and millions of tons of water is able to rise. When seventy-two percent of your body is water, you think it won't rise at all? It does. <laughs> so, I don't know if you're conscious of it, but in India, most people are, not only in India, in anywhere, wherever there are mental asylums and things, they are conscious of it. On full moon days and new moon days, people get exaggerated levels of disturbance in their minds. So people think new moon and full moon will cause madness. No, that's not the truth. If you're very loving, full moon day you will become more loving. If you're very joyful, on a full moon day you will become more joyful. If you're little crazy, you'll get little more crazy. Whatever is your quality gets little hyped on that day. So those who are romantic, they want full moon day. Those who want to meditate, they want full moon day. Those who are a little mad, they don't want full moon day <laughs> Essentially, it's hyping things up a little bit. Of course, today there is another kind of textbook science which is going on, which doesn't observe anything except what happens in the laboratory. These people are going on saying, this is all rubbish, this, that. No, if you pay attention to your own body, you will know without looking up, without looking at the calendar, you will know when is full moon day, when is new moon day by yourself, simply if you pay su sufficient attention to your own system because it's visible in your system, certain behavior is there. But with a human being, the problem is, or people seeing it a problem, any, pro any possibility, if you do not explore that possibility, in your eyes it looks like a problem. What is a problem is always a possibility, isn't it? You don't like it? No, if you're not willing to say yes, no, something, you can at least say, hmm 
what is a problem, is always a possibility or no? What is a possibility? If you do not explore it, if you do not realize what is the possibility, it seems like a problem to you. So, do inanimate things have impact on you? Yes, if you allow it, because this is the human predicament that who you are is not determined by nature, it is left open for you. Left open for you means you are the only creature on this planet who's been given the freedom to shape your own life. Is it a small thing? This is a product of millions of years of evolution that today after all these creatures from a single-celled animal, to after these millions of forms, here we are sitting, this is the only creature which can shape its own life the way it wants. Every other creature has to live by the laws of nature. We can shape our own lives. It is this freedom that human beings are suffering. If you're suffering your bondage, it's all right. If you're suffering your freedom, you're a disaster, isn't it? Hmm? You're suffering your bondages, you're chained to something, you're suffering that, understandable. But you're suffering because you're free. Most human beings are suffering because they're free. They're always trying to bind themselves to something or somebody all the time because freedom scares them because freedom is a pathless path. Freedom is an open terrain, there's no fixed line. Because there is no fixed pathway, most people feel terrified. But the highest value in human life is freedom, isn't it so? Hello? In this culture, the highest value in this culture is not God, not heaven, Mukti, moksha, liberation, freedom is the highest value established that no matter what you do, you must seek mukti. You can do whatever you do with your life, but all that process should be towards your liberation. You must be moving towards higher and higher levels of freedom on a daily basis. Otherwise, your life is not worth it because you're getting entangled with the process of life. Even if you go to heaven, it's an entanglement. See, I'm sure before you joined IIT, you're still keeping Bombay, right? I see. Hmm? Before you joined IIT, when uh, you have written your, ad you know, whatever entrance tests and stuff, only thing is somehow I want to get in, I want to get in because it, it's like heaven, entering heaven. No matter what, I want to get in, that's the only thing I want. After you get in, see how many problems <laughs> I'm asking you a simple question. Being on this planet, do you have any proof that you are not already in heaven and making a mess out of it? Huh? Do you have any proof? Suppose you took off from this solar system and looked down at this solar system, whatever these twelve, fourteen planets and satellites and works, does planet Earth definitely look like a heavenly body among all these? Yes or no? So you are already on heaven and making a mess out of it and now you want to go to another heaven. <laughs> yes, like he wants to go to Canada, <laughs> this culture does not value heaven, does not value God, values only freedom. We want to be even free from the creation and the creator. Mukti, moksha is the ultimate value because this is not a philosophical value, this is not a religious value, this is something every life is longing for. Only thing is, most human beings are short-sighted that they long for it in installments. See, whatever people are seeking right now, if they have nothing, they will say, if I get hundred rupees per day, Shiva, that's all I want, that's a prayer. 
hundred rupees fell. Hundred rupees, fine, 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 three days, hundred rupees, fine. Fourth day, only hundred rupees, Shiva. <laughs> What's the problem with you? Are you so stingy? At least a thousand rupees a day. Okay, thousand rupee note for… is it in legal tender, thousand rupee note? Huh? No, no, okay, two thousand rupees fell <laughs> I don't want to get into trouble with that <laughs> Where is thousand rupees falling for Sadhguru? Where does he have? <laughs> no, no, two thousand rupees fell. You asked for thousand, two thousand fell. Wonderful Shiva, fantastic. After ten days, Oh, only two thousand rupees. <laughs> it doesn't matter how much it falls, something more, something more, something more, isn't it? This is not about money. People think it's about money. Th people think it's about wealth, power, pleasure, love, knowledge, no. These are all different currencies. Essentially, you're looking for expansion because you feel suffocated. If we keep you in the same place for too long, you feel suffocated, you want expansion, you want to be something more all the time. Yes or no? Always something more. If I make you the king of this planet, not just Canada, <laughs> if I make you the king of this planet, will you settle with fulfillment? No, you will look at the other planets, you look at the new galaxies. So there is something within a human being which wants to expand limitlessly. That means it wants to be free, nothing else. Looking at this carefully, observing the nature of the life within that it wants to expand in a limitless way, the only thing it is longing for is to become boundless. That means it's seeking freedom. That is why in this culture we established the highest value is mukti or moksha which means liberation or freedom, not heaven, not… because heaven is just another place. Maybe little better accommodations, <laughs> but same trouble after some time, isn't it? Sadhguru, I can proudly say that I am in the top institute of eminence, which we now call heaven, and <laughs> every student who has come here has burned himself inside out to come to this place. And that can be said about each and every institute in India. And after coming to this heaven also, our days and nights are same, working very hard to achieve the so-called aim. I want to know, but still, our careers are not assured. We don't know about our career. And we don't know whether our dream, luxurious life of our dreams, whether we will ever achieve. Now, when we say about the other aspect, seeing the politicians, most of them and rich criminals, most of them, at least almost fifth pass, not more than that, but they, they and their dependents, all having a assured career… But they don't go to Canada, they go to London <laughs> They go to London, yeah. And <laughs> citizenship of London is assured and at the same time, they are having best of luxuries. So my point is, education and working day and night hard for it, is it worth for this society where we have poorer graduates and richer illiterates? Well, we must understand, uh, liter literacy is on many different levels. ABC is one kind of literacy. On the street, there is another kind of literacy. In the political sphere, another kind of literacy. In the business world, another kind of literacy. So literacy is not just A, B, C, D, that's a very simplistic way of looking at it. Somebody may not know A, B, C, but uh, he is very literate with something else. And above all, you come to an Indian institute of technology, not for a luxurious life, because of thirst for knowledge, to know, to become competent, to be able to create something. to be able to create something in the world which has not been done till now. Not to somehow amass something at somebody's cost and live somewhere, wherever you think is luxurious. Look at their faces and see, do they look joyful? Well, they look like they've been fed like pigs that you can see, but 
do they look joyful, do they look fulfilled, do they… is there some great energy about them? Do you want to live a life like that? Hello? Do you want to live a life like that, I'm asking? Please don't ever seek a life like that because all you have in this life is, as I already said in the very beginning, this is just a certain amount of time. Time is going away. Since you sat here, here you are about thirty-five minutes or more than that, an hour. An hour closer to your grave right now, you know this, since you came here. Yes, all of us, yes or no? Mortality is one thing that we've forgotten, that is why we are thinking of all these funny things. Life is just going away. If you really, if this second to you, actually minute by minute, minute by minute, you are closer to your grave, it's going to be over. So what will be the most important thing? How profound is your experience of life? And when it comes to activity, how profoundly can you touch life around you? This is all that matters, isn't it? Your experience of life is profound. When you sit here, in your experience, this is the most profound experience because this is all that matters, the intensity and profoundness of your experience. When it comes to activity, what a difference can you make? You may not be thinking like that right now, but think through this. Suppose you cook something, do you ever? Uh, Maggie <laughs> Uh, <laughs> he's an MSG or something, huh? <laughs> no, 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 not that MSG, I'm… Uh, I just <laughs> what is that chemical, huh? That's all… Sodium blue time. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, if you cook something, even if you make Maggi noodles and you give it to your friend, eat it back, <laughs> he spits it out. Do you like it? If he eats and say, this is fantastic, then you say, oh, nice. Because for even doing the two-minute job, it's two minutes, right? The ad says it's two minutes, I don't know how long it takes, huh? That's amazing, it's not two minutes. Even for the two-minute job, you want to touch that somebody's life? If that guy spat it out, that's the last time you're going to give him those noodles. That saves his life, that's another matter <laughs> So if you build something, let's say you built a hall, people look at this and say, oh my god, terrible and nobody wants to come into this hall. You want to build such a hall? No, you want people to come and say, wow. Yes? You want to write a book that nobody reads? Huh? No? You want to make a movie that nobody wants to see? No, you want people to see and walk out with tears in their eyes, yes or no? When you do something, you must understand this. Human activity is meaningful only in some way we touch another life. How many lives is the question. You heard of Richard Bach? No. As a generation, you never read Richard Bach? Nobody? Oh, I'm surprised. In our generation, there was nobody who did not read Richard Bach. Please look him up. Richard Bach wrote a book called Illusions, another one called Jonathan Livingstone Seagull. It's all about flying his entire life. I was supposed to fly with him three years ago, but uh, at the age of seventy-four, he was flying a small plane and uh, he had an accident and broke some sixteen bones in his body. So after that, he's not flying. <laughs> So, his entire life was about flight and all his books are about flight and how flight relates to our life. And in one of the books he writes, of all the joys of flying, <laughs> I thought this is… after that I stopped reading him. <coughs> after… of all the joys of flying that he elogized all his life, he said the greatest joy is when you see another pilot and you roll your wings and he responds rolling his wings, that's the greatest joy <laughs> After living an absolutely adventurous life, this is 
the greatest joy because touching another life it always is like that. Whether it's music or dance or cooking or writing a book or building something, everything is because it touches another life, it matters, isn't it? A criminal does not touch other people's life like that. You have two ways to live, that is, people are ha people are joyful because you're here or people will be joyful because you're gone. <laughs> there are two ways to live. Please, what will you choose? First one <laughs> First one? People are joyful because you're here. Yes, yes, that's, yes, that's good. So, about somebody is living better than us, I'm saying you should not even look how somebody is living because it's a bloody brief life, believe me. Before you know what's happening, it'll be gone. You may not think so right now, you think you have a lot of time on your hands. But if you intensely get involved in something, before you know what is happening, life will be gone. Because it's such a brief life. Have you noticed on a particular day, if you are very intense and joyfully involved in something, Twenty-four hours just pass off like a minute, is it so? Another day you're a little depressed and looking around at everybody. That day twenty-four hours feel like a eon. So time is a very relative experience. Only miserable people will have a long life because in misery time stretches itself. But if you're living an intense and exuberant life, Poof, it'll be gone, hundred years will be gone like that. Shall I bless you with a long life? No. no. Even if you live to be hundred, it should feel like you lived for two days. And that's how it will be. That is how it will be if you focus on creating something worthwhile. But if you're looking at other people, who is wearing better clothes, who is driving a better car, whose house is better than mine, if you look at this, your life is ruined because forever somebody will be wearing something better than you, somebody will be driving something better than you, somebody will be living in a better home than you, yes or no? Forever you will become enslaved to that nonsense. Don't ever start your life like that. All of you, you're being empowered through education. You must think in terms of, what is it that I can create? What can I create in this life? Don't worry about how to earn a living with so much education and this many cerebral cells. You think earning a living is a problem when an earthworm does it? The Youth and Truth program has uh, such wide and intense coverage nationally and internationally that social media has been buzzing and flooded with questions. Uh, we have the difficult job handpicking some of the questions. So Sadhguru, with your permission, I'd like to convey the questions to you. So one Pradeep asks, we are often reprimanded for using swear words. It is nowadays used as colloquial slang. What, what is the big deal with using slang words when I casually use it without intent? See, uh, <clears throat> this happened, a nice Catholic girl got married and went. After three days, she called her mother and said, Mama, I can't be here with this guy, all the time he's using four-letter words <laughs> Then the mother asked, what kind of four-letter words is he using? She said, he's talking about cook, clean, wash, iron. <laughs> so, what is wrong in using words? Essentially, what you're calling as swear words is largely today. We have our own swear words which are uh, very generic to our languages and uh, some are vulgar, some suggest certain intentions, some refer to our families and <laughs> uh, and some are just simply poking fun at each other kind. 
but largely your swear words in English language that you use today are essentially picked up from America, it's either toilet or bedroom, okay? <laughs> I must tell you this, this is way back many years ago, someone, a guest came from Australia, I'm talking about nearly forty years ago. A guest came from Australia and uh, I'm supposed to take this person around in Mysore. You know, Mysore is a touristy place, you're from Bangalore, huh? It's a touristy place, there are many places to see, so I'm taking this person on my motorcycle. If I... if I ride hard, I hear in my ears, shit. <laughs> then I think, what, if I break, shit. They see something beautiful, shit. <laughs> if they, the food is very spicy, oh shit. <laughs> I was thinking, why this person whole day chanting shit like mantra <laughs> I thought maybe constipated, trying to invoke because what should be done in the morning, whole day, why are you dragging it through the day, you know? <laughs> Then I observed, they're getting angry, shit, and they become little calm. Oh, then I thought, oh, it's working for them, I should not disturb this, because <laughs> I don't believe in disturbing anything that's working for anybody. If it's working, let's leave it. So I just thought through this, See, we have look at the, looked at the whole science of uttering sounds in a powerful manner, what it can do to your consciousness, what it can do to your body, what it can do to invigorate your energy, many, many aspects of this. And then we say, Shiva! <laughs> With the necessary preparation, if I make you utter this one sound, you don't have to believe in any god or anything, just the sound, it'll blow your brains out. I can show you this. Then I thought, shit, shit, shit. Oh, we arrived at it scientifically, they somehow got it <laughs> In… even in Shiva, it is only she which is the powerful part, Va is a dampener so that people don't blow up too much, it's like to balance. Well, instead of va, they put tea. <laughs> I thought it's okay, it's working, so why? Because usually when they say, when they keep saying too often, the tea doesn't come, they say shh. <laughs> so even me, when I say shiva, the va doesn't really come out, it's just shh. <laughs> so I thought it's okay, what does it matter? Then immediately some people got very this thing, Sadhguru, you are saying Shiva and shit are same, <laughs> highest and the lowest. I said, see, this high and low is all your business. But as far as your mind is concerned, in case your vocabulary is stored in an alpha alphabetical order, Shiva and shit are close together. <laughs> you cannot store Shiva here and shit here, you don't have such a capability. I don't know how it is stored in your mind. Suppose it's alphabetical, they are right next to each other, so you can't separate them. So the question is not about what is good, what is bad, what is right, what is wrong. The question is, will it work everywhere? If you keep shitting all over the place, is it going to work for you? <laughs> That's a question. So it's all right among young people, you're saying shit, shit everywhere. But now it's come to America, in United States it's come, even the top administrators are uttering these words just like that. In the international community when they utter such words, it's finished in many things, in many ways, okay? Not because of anything else, simply because people are, you know, if you watch this, some of these American movies and stuff uh, and uh, stand-up comedians, they are making the whole sentence with one word. Yes? Whole sentence is just one word repeated in many different ways and they're elogizing that. I'm saying to develop or to evolve a complex language, 
It took such a long time, it taken thousands of years for human mind. One of the most complicated things that we have come up with as a civilizations in the world is language. Language is not a small thing. That way in India, <laughs> we have thirteen hundred languages. How much genius must have been there that right here you speaking Marathi, somebody speaking Telugu, somebody speaking Kannada, somebody speaking Konkani and for thousands of years though you lived side by side, you maintained your literature, they maintained theirs, like this they managed. This takes a certain level of genius to develop the language. Now a language which had hundreds and thousands of words, you want to reduce everything to one word and you think it's a forward step, I'm sorry. <laughs> Sadhguru, uh, my, again my next question is about the four letters. Love is in the air. When… Hey, what's, what's happening out here <laughs> <laughs> When people say that they are in love, they think they are in unconditional love. But still, in most of the cases, it's not working. They, it doesn't lead to happiness. So Sadhguru, when is unconditional love truly possible? <laughs> when you say love, your experience of love means you feel certain sweetness of emotion within yourself. Either by looking at this person or this person or this person, we don't know who stimulates this in you. It doesn't matter who helped you, but essentially it happened within you, isn't it? Yes? Did it happen only within you or was it in the air? I'm trying to clear this air <laughs> Combination of both. Really? It was in the air? No, it only happened within you. Maybe what was happening within you was so exuberant, you saw it everywhere. You're in love, you thought the flowers bloomed for you, the birds are singing for you, the clouds are moving for you. Huh? All right, I don't want to destroy all the romance, okay <laughs> But essentially it's happening within you. It's wonderful that you're experiencing such sweetness of emotion, stimulated by somebody. You are using the other person as a key to open up an experience within you, essentially. I'm asking you, why are you using a key when there is no lock, when there is no door? when there's no any kind of barrier. It is just that you are a push-start machine. You know what's a push-start machine? If you have owned an ambassador twenty-five years ago, always you parked it on a gradient like this, because morning two people have to push it. <laughs> if you park it like this, nobody will come, your family will not come out of the house. <laughs> if it's like this, somebody will come and push it. Now all the cars are self-start. Many of them remote start. What does it mean? Technological upgradation. You are an institute of technology, all right? I'm asking, would you like to upgrade your technology that you are on self-start? If you wake up in the morning, you are overflowing with joy and love and exuberance by yourself. You don't need anybody to stimulate you. Would you like to be a self-start machine? <laughs> then you must come to me, huh? Whoever is right now doing the love in the air, <laughs> it's fine with them, you don't have to tell them anything, you say, all right, it's okay. But <laughs> it's very important you're a self-start machine, otherwise after some time you try to extract happiness from the other person. That is when these love affairs become tedious and horrible because you're trying to extract happiness from the other person. No, life should be like this, when it comes to joy, when it comes to love, when it comes to exuberance of life, you must be the source of this, isn't it? You must be the source of this. Well, other things are shared in life. There are two ways to enter into a relationship. One way is because you want to extract something from somebody. Another way is because you want to share something with somebody. These are two ways. If you're out to share, your life will be good. If you're out to extract, when they close the tap, it's going to get terrible and nasty. You have seen people who thought they're absolute lovers, how terrible it becomes for many of them. Not because there's anything wrong with them, 
simply because you started off on the wrong footing, thinking, this person is the source of my joy. No, no, no. Joy or misery, the source is within you. Yes or no? Whether it's joy or misery, the source is within you. It's for you to decide. If you're a joyful human being, they will also want to be with you. If you're a misery, they will endure you for some time. Shall I tell you a joke? Are you okay? Yes, <laughs> Sadhguru. On a certain day, Shankaran Pillai was walking in a park in the evening, sunset time. He saw a young, pretty-looking woman sitting on a stone bench. You know the park benches? He also went on, sat down, settled down on the same bench. After some time, he moved a little closer. She moved little away. He allowed a few minutes and again moved little closer. She moved little away. Again he moved closer. Now there was nowhere else to go for her because she was at the end of the bench. She pushed him away. Then he waited for two minutes, just the sun to get to the right angle. Then he went down on his knees and he said, I love you. I love you like I have never loved anybody in my life. You know a woman is a fool for love. And the sun was setting. If it was middle of the afternoon, she wouldn't believe a damn thing <laughs> Sun was setting, the ambience was right and she kind of yielded. Nature took over, things happened between them. Then he looked at his watch, it was eight o'clock in the evening. He got up and he said, I need to go, I need to go. She said, where are you going? You said you love me. He said, my wife is waiting, I need to go. So, I love you for a whole lot of people is like that, you know, open sesame, you want to get something, maybe your needs are physical, psychological, emotional, financial, social or we don't know what else. You have needs to fulfill, so you use this mantra and it works, half the time it works, okay? I'm saying it's important, it is important you know the joy of being loving because sweetness of emotion is needed for you if you want to take really big steps in your life. If you do not have sweetness of love in your heart, believe me, if you try to take big steps in the world, particularly in India, you will end up frustrated and go to Canada <laughs> In Canada, you meet only moose <laughs> in most of the countries, so it's okay. Now I would like to open the forum to the audience so that if they have any questions, they can ask Sadhguru uh, directly. So let's, let's start with the audience questions for now. Sadhguru, Namaskaram. Myself, Pratiti Sarkar. I'm a PhD student here in IIT. Sadhguru, um, every time we have some uh, submission, me and my friends would plan in advance and uh, we would try to stick to it. But somehow, ultimately it happens that we end up finishing it in the very last minute. So before I used to think like why I wasn't uh, starting it early or why I couldn't finish it early. But then I realized that almost everyone around me is doing the sa uh, same thing and everyone is procrastinating. So my question is then, uh, what's the reason? Why do we knowingly procrastinate? See, uh... The longing that you had when you wanted to get into the institute, you have not maintained that longing. Please sit down, it's okay. You have not maintained that same level of longing. How badly you wanted to get in? If you maintain the same level of longing, you would prepone everything that you're doing. Slowly, you slacken up and other things interest you, education sinks down a little bit. If you are doing something that you really want to do, will you prepone or postpone? Will you prepone or postpone? You'll prepone. If love is in the air, will you prepone or postpone? Prepone, sure. Prepone. <laughs> so, in a way, intellectually, knowledge is a love affair. It's really a love affair. If you get involved, it will become much bigger love affair than emotional love affairs. 
So if you conduct your education like a love affair, that you're really involved, then you will always prepone, not postpone. But if you finish too early, that means your faculty is not setting you tight enough time. They must set more stringent time because this is the time of your life where you have to learn how to stretch yourself physically, mentally, in every possible way. Otherwise, life will crack you when you go outside, unless you find a government job for yourself. <laughs> Otherwise, anything else you take up in your life, if you do not know how to physically and mentally stretch yourself without breaking, then life will break you somewhere. So, education time, the time of being youthful is not a leisure time. Unfortunately, you know, in, uh, this may sound like this, a little difficult for you, but you must come and visit and see how it happens. These children came and performed here just now, the calorie, and we have a home school. All these are seven days of the week school. We have planned four to five days in a month as activity days which the children won't know. Someday it will be instead of academics, it will be some other kind of activity. But those activity days are more intense than the academic days. When you're growing up, when you're young, you should not be thinking about leisure. Unfortunately, this culture from United States has come, what is that, TG… TGF? Thank God, it's Friday. So if you're going to enjoy only weekends and weeks, you're going to suffer. That means you're doing something that you have no love for. I'm asking, why the hell are you doing it? Why the hell are you doing something that you don't care for? Because it's your life. Your life is just a certain amount of time. If you're doing something that you don't care for, that means you don't even see that your life is precious, isn't it? I'm asking, is your life precious? If it's precious, you must invest it in what truly matters to you. If you invest it in what truly matters to you, you will always prepone, not postpone. You're also TGIF <laughs> <laughs> for coming to our campus today, um, very Let, exciting. If you can hold it like this, you know. I'm like, you know, you've seen Lady Gaga like this <laughs> ah. Is that good? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm very excited to have you here with us. Uh, my question is, uh, when, I was growing as a, when I was growing as a child, uh, both my parents were working and there were times I was feeling lonely and very miserable. Although my parents did give their part of comfort to me, the, the, it were, there were times I was feeling lonely in the, in, on the inside. And um, uh, what can our future parents or what can we do to our kids not, to not feel the same way? Thank you. Well, uh, in India, this is the first generation where women have stepped out to work professionally. Otherwise, because we were largely an agricultural community, women worked but in and around the house. And if they went somewhere to the field, they took their children and went. So always like you see ducks and chicken, if the hen goes behind that, the chicks run. Like that, children were always running behind women. So she, she was always doing her work and still managing and tending to them and there was a certain cohesiveness to that. But today women are going to the office or to the factory or to some other business, so they can't take their children there. This is the first generation of women who have stepped out. So in the society, we still don't have arrangements, proper arrangements where children can be properly tended to. That system, <coughs> that facility and that arrangement has simply not happened in the society yet. I hope it happens quickly because it's very important. It doesn't matter whether it's a biological parent or somebody else, but children need a loving, caring atmosphere. It's very important, just putting nourishment into their stomach is not the only thing. If they need some tending, attending to somebody should smile at them, somebody should laugh at them, somebody should do something with them, play with them. This is very needed, otherwise children will grow up little sick in their head. It is not necessary, only a biological mother should do it but there must be a committed person doing this. It's very, very important for the child. 
Unfortunately, in this society, we still don't have those arrangements. Naskaram Sadhguru, uh, I want to know that uh, when a student steps into college, uh, all of a sudden he gets, he or she gets access to a huge amount of pornographic material which so far was off limits for him or her. And in the process, he or she enjoys that and as we said, uh, he experiences, he or she experiences heaven on earth. But, uh, and we even have nicknames for those people who overdo it, they masturbate. We overdo it sometimes. So how do we know how much of that is good or bad? And uh, so can we have the truth about masturbation? Oh, it looks like a popular question. Eh? <laughs> See, uh, we have a biology, we cannot put it under the carpet, it's there. It's best we address it for what it is. But right now the problem in the world is, because certain religious institutions in the world took this attitude that the very biology of the human being is wrong, because of this, culture started hiding it under the carpet. Well, in this culture we never had it, but after the British came and left, we became more prudish than the British. But before that, if you look at our temples, uh, all the outside temple art is all pornographic, if that's what you want to call it. But we don't call it pornographic, we are only talking about the various dimensions of human biology. Because we don't see it as wrong, but we see it as the periphery of life. If you stay there only, you will stay on the physical dimension forever, you will not explore anything else. So in the temple, always it's the periphery. You are supposed to look at that and understand it's the periphery of life and try to make an attempt to go deeper, but at the same time not to be in denial of it. Not to glorify it or not to be in denial of it is the most important thing. But in your college, watching these things on the poor, whatever, your internet or whatever, people tell me that uh, Somebody told me, I, I don't know if these percentages are correct. When I was asking, what is the content? I was trying to understand the internet and its content. What is the real content on the internet? They're telling me, you should know. They're telling me seventy percent of the content on the internet is pornography. Is it so? Is it so? You must be the expert <laughs> Is somebody doing PhD on it? <laughs> they told me seventy percent. I said seventy percent is unreasonable and sick levels of pornography. If it occupies a small percentage, it's okay. Seventy percent of a technological platform which could do millions of things, unfortunately is pornographic, just biology of life is very unfortunate because once you come as a human being, your biology is not the front end of your life. It is one part of your life. This cerebral capability came so that your intelligence becomes the front end of your life and if you become conscious, your consciousness becomes the front end of your life. Biology is the front end of a, a bull, it's okay for him, that's all he knows. But biology should not be the front end of a human life, it is part of our life. We are not denying it. So. At a certain stage in your life, it's like this. A ninety-five-year-old man went for a medical checkup with his doctor. The doctor did a thorough checkup and said, Hey, old boy, you're doing great for ninety-five, no problem with you. Then the old man asked, Doctor, but what about my sex life? Then the doctor looked at him and asked, thinking about it or talking about it? <laughs> so at different stages of life, there are some times you only think about it and talk about it, there are some times you indulge in it. Uh, these are passing phases of life. How much of it is needed for you, you are the best judge. But at the same time, you came here not to explore your biology, 
at least you should have gone to <laughs> uh, MSc in biology. You shouldn't be wasting your time in a technological institute exploring biology. Does it mean to say you don't have biology, you don't have biological needs? You have, it's fine, but it must be on the periphery. It should not become the core of your life because it will reduce you in the sense. A creature which was purely biological evolved into a place which has an intelligence of its own beyond its biology. See, animal intelligence works for its biology alone. How to get its food, how to get its mate, this is all its entire life is. If human intelligence also functions like that, you are bellying the evolutionary process. You are seeing how to go back, take the evolutionary process backward, not necessary. This does not mean you do not have a body, body has its needs as, it, as there is physical hunger, so there is sexuality. You have to address it in some way, but to what extent is your choice, but definitely it should not be the front end of your life because you are rolling back evolutionary scheme of putting your intelligence and consciousness in the front, instead of that you're putting your biology in the front. Uh, Sadhguru, I've been watching your videos and they've really changed me a lot. So today, sir, uh, Sadhguru, I'm a guitar player and I'm doing engineer, uh, engineering, I'm in second year. So often, like, obviously my Indian parents want me to have a steady life. So they sent me to an engineering college to get settled, but they even support me for guitar. But both are getting so hectic for me, like I can't keep my focus on one thing. Like when I'm studying, I think about guitar and all the players and music. And similarly, when I'm playing, I think about other things. And even uh, social circles and all, I don't have a steady mind and I can't focus uh, at one thing even if I try a lot, even mobile is a very big distraction apparently. So? So how do I focus on one thing at a time? Oh. I, I fear that if I give too much time to one thing, I might lose or lack uh, in other things. See, uh, <clears throat> human mind, do I have a few minutes to answer this question? See, the nature of human intelligence is such that it can do many things at the same time as a process. When I say intelligence, most people are misunderstanding intelligence as intellect. Intellect is your thought process. Thought is just one dimension of your intelligence. Thought is only happening because of the data that you have gathered in your mind. You cannot think about anything for which you have no data, isn't it so? Isn't it so? Isn't it so? Yes. You're getting sleepy? Because usually we put children to sleep at eight. <laughs> so, uh, Human intelligence is made like this. We… In, in the yogic way of looking at life, we look at human intelligence as sixteen parts. Out of these sixteen parts, we can… for the sake of understanding, we can see it as four segments. These four segments are buddhi, ahankara, manas and chitta. Buddhi means the intellect. Intellect. When it comes to your intellect, would you like your, a sharp intellect or a dull intellect? You must choose, I'm going to bless you right now. Sharp intellect. So obviously intellect is a cutting instrument, it's like a knife, it's a scalpel. It's good for cutting. If you want to dissect something, you need a good sharp intellect. But suppose you want to sew something, all you have is a knife. If you sew with a knife, you know what will happen? <laughs> you will leave everything in tatters. 
But right now, this is the way we are going about because our education systems are focused just purely intellectual basis. This is a cutting instrument. If I want to really know you, shall I dissect you? Hello? I want to know you, so shall I dissect you? Well, some of you in your uh, maybe pre-university studies, you dissected a frog and you were very excited how the heart was beating. The frog was not excited, believe me. <laughs> it was looking at you, what's wrong with you? <laughs> yes or no? So, intellect is a certain instrument. It is a cutting instrument, it can be used for certain aspects of life. But unfortunately, we are using it all pervasive because other dimensions of intelligence have not even been touched. The next dimension of intelligence is called identity. The next dimension of the mind is called identity or the ahankara. Identity means depending upon what you're identified with, that's how your intellect will function. This is a knife in the front, this will always try to protect what you're identified with. You say, I'm a mo woman, it'll try to protect your gender. You say, I'm an Indian, it'll try to protect your nationality. You say you're some religion, it'll try to protect that. Whatever is your identity, your intellect is always working to protect that identity. So how we establish this identity consciously is a very important part of education which we have completely ignored today, for which we are paying a huge price. In the traditional education, from zero to twelve is balavastha, that means just to play, eat, sleep, so that the body and the brain should grow till they are twelve years of age. You should not try to teach anything, extract anything. From twelve to twenty-four is focused learning. This is called as brahmacharya, discipline of how to learn. Learn is not just learning other disciplines, but above all, learning about the nature of my own human mechanism, my intelligence, my different faculties, how they function, because if I don't understand this, I cannot really apply myself into anything. So, we always establish this, you might have heard of this, there is something called as Aham Brahmasmi at the age of twelve. This is taught to a child before we initiate a child into education. First, he must take a universal identity that my identity is the larger universe. Maybe today I'm an Indian, maybe today I belong to this religion or that religion, maybe I belong to this caste, clan or whatever, but my large, larger identity is with the universe because education was seen as an empowerment. We don't want to empower you when your identity is narrow because all the crime on the planet, all the corruption on the planet, all the horrendous things that people to do to each other is only because of limited identity, isn't it? I can do it to you, but I can't do it to myself because this is me, isn't it? I can't do it to my own child, but I can do it to somebody else because this is mine and that is not mine. So before you are empowered with education, which we seen as a powerful tool for life, First thing is take a universal identity. Unfortunately, we've neglected because of this. Today, if you see, the cutting edge of technology and science always goes first for military use. Yes or no? So how to kill people, how to dominate somebody, how to destroy somebody, this is where our knowledge is going simply because we did not establish a universal identity before education came to people. So the third dimension of your mind is referred to as manas. Manas means it's a silo of memory. When I say memory, it's not just what you remember, your entire body is memory. There is evolutionary memory here, there is genetic memory here, there is karmic memory here, there is articulate and inarticulate levels of memory, conscious and unconscious levels of memory, various dimensions of memory, we identify eight different forms of memory. Right now, you may not remember how your great-great-great-grandfather looked like ten generations ago, but his nose is sitting on your face. Body remembers, yes or no? Body absolutely remembers everything. So this memory is the basis of your intellect. 
If we take away the memory or delink the memory from your intellect, your in intellect will become without activity. This is one important dimension of yoga that we understood that if we... See, if you want to continue the knife analogy, the intellect is like a knife. The hand that holds the knife is identity. Knife is useful or dangerous depending upon not on the knife's quality, but the hand which holds it, isn't it? If you're identified one way, this knife will poke you. If you're identified in a different way, this knife can save your life. So the same knife every day saves lives and sometimes takes lives, depending upon who holds it or which hand holds it. So we delink the menace with the intellect. Now, intellect simply there without intention. So essentially, yoga means this, to build an intensity within you without intent. Right now, I want to become an engineer, I want to become rich, I want to make money, I want to be this, I want to be that, you become goal-oriented. This is the fundamental flaw in the education system, we've become goal-oriented. Because we want to get there, we're doing all this, we're like circus monkeys. Circus monkeys are like this, you show a banana and say, you do all those tricks, I'll give you a banana. So it will do all the tricks, banana. No banana, you will simply sit there. So, once you become human, you should not behave like a circus monkey. It is not because of a carrot and stick that you're driving yourself, because you're seeing that what you're doing is of some consequence to you and to the world around you. That's why the action. So if you delink the knife and the hand and the silo of memory, then your intellect will shine with sharpness. It will not be rusted with memory. It will shine with sharpness. See, it's like this. There are uh, some people who are... <laughs> when you go to restaurants, you will see and maybe in some homes also. You ask them to cut a mango, uh, they will use the same knife with which they've cut onion and they cut the mango and give you. You can't keep it in your mouth, the sweetness of the mango is gone. If the residual impact of whatever the, in the knife has touched is there in it, slowly it will lose its purpose, isn't it? The same goes for your intellect. If the memory sticks to your intellect, after some time, it will become a useless intellect because it becomes a highly prejudiced intellect. So, the entire yogic system is about this, to dissolve your identity and simply sit here so that your intellect will shine like a razor without any intent, intensity without intent, if it comes into your intellect you can do twenty-five things at the same time, just like that, okay? People keep asking me, Sadhguru, you... you have been busy the whole six months, not a day's break, then how did you write this poem? How did you think about this? How did you come up this plan? How did you design this one and that one? I have twelve, fourteen tracks running all the time, I just initiate and leave, they will run by themselves. See, when a computer is able to process something, if you feed and leave, it processes, isn't it? Isn't this a better computer than anything that you have ever used? Hello? Only problem is you did not read the user's manual for this one. <laughs> you must read the user's manual. So just listening to videos is no good. We can teach you a simple practice. You start the practice of delinking the intellect from the memory at least for a few minutes a day, you will see your intellect become super competent. I want to ask you that, uh, what is logic and, and why it... and why it uh, looks as logical? Means, because uh, whenever I start thinking, means it seems that, yeah, yeah, means this is logical and this is logical. But when I do the uh, maths, so there is a uh, ambiguity. So, so if uh, it is logical, then why it is not coming to the math? Or the second question is uh, how to express means of myself. Uh, the feeling which I have don't have words. So how to 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 create means of words for my 
her feeling that yeah means what i actually a feel and means how to understand the others that what is going on in me okay that, that's it oh uh, <clears throat> see whether somebody else understands what's happening within me or not is not the issue whether i perceive what's happening within me or not is the main issue whether this person understands me or not is his problem the question is what's happening within me is it clear to me this is the important thing if it's clear to me whether i find words for it or not doesn't matter about logical and illo illogical and the mathematic even the mathematics is only logical to a certain point that is why they came up with uh, calculus it's quite illogical <laughs> yes or no <laughs> so because they want to explore dimensions of existence which don't all fall into simple logic that is why we came up with mathematics or the type of mathematics that we are doing right now which is not really logically correct but it articulates certain aspects of the existence so instead of worrying about what is logical what is illogical life is absolutely logical material is logical so only handling material aspects of life we have to be perfectly logical when it comes to other dimensions of life it's not logical and in fact all the most beautiful aspects of your life are not logical if you if you uh, try to logically find expression to every dimension of your life you will feel silly suppose you fall in love with somebody and you write it in prose you will look stupid but you write in poetry suddenly it's beautiful because poetry allows illogical expression prose does not allow logical uh, illogical expression so you cannot do illogic in arithmetic or geometry but trigonometry is there <laughs> illogical <laughs> so in every sphere of life people have understood that logic has its limits and they have found why ways to explore life through means which are not necessarily 100% logical your logic your logic fits into this life perfectly well but don't try to fit the life into logic it doesn't fit uh thanks for um, giving me this opportunity i want to ask that uh, when we are roaming on the street uh even the dog also not happy and we are also not happy please hold this uh, little closer to you. yeah uh, it's quite safe huh? mother nature give us a brain but we are responsible for everything to take care of plant birds but we are not taking care even we are not happy for ourselves and not we are ca ha keeping happy to the mother nature so what we have done for our life means it's our responsibility mother nature give to a responsibility to a human to us to take care of everything but we are not taking care and not even we are happy okay thank you uh i don't know where you saw an unhappy dog it must be a mumbai dog <laughs> <laughs> huh must be a Mumbai street dog where uh, <laughs> too many vehicles and things are moving around poor guy is just surviving day to day otherwise dogs are happy if their stomach is full they are really very happy go in the villages and small towns and see they just romping around happily as long as they are well fed they are happy so human beings also not that everybody is unhappy there are happy people and unhappy people they always were still are we are seeing how to increase the percentage of happy people so that we can live in a joyful world it's out of my greed that i'm incessantly active in the world because i want to live in a joyful world but lot of people are 
looking like carrying an end-of-the-world expression on their face, as if the world is going to end today. Especially if the world is going to end today, it's time to be joyful, isn't it <laughs> So, we are living irresponsibly for sure, for various reasons we are like this. For us in this country, we… we have an enormous culture, enormous. No nation on the planet has twelve, fifteen thousand years of history and culture. This culture we can use to become wise and wonderful, but a whole lot of people use it in a different way. <laughs> because you said everybody's unhappy, I thought I'll tell you a joke. You okay? It once happened, the, Iraq, the Iraqi ambassador to India met Shankaran Pillai. <laughs> when people of two ancient cultures meet, it's bullshit time <laughs> always. How our culture, you know, because we've got nothing much to show in the present, we po talk a lot about the past. Well, we can be proud about our past, but we can't live there. We are proud about the past history of this nation, the culture of this nation, but you cannot live there, you can only live here. But this is the usual thing. So the Mesopotamian culture, big. So the Iraqi ambassador started off and he said, our culture is so great that we have excavated sites in Iraq where the site is over twenty-five-hundred years ago, two-thousand-five-hundred-year-old sites and we found copper wires. It proves that we had telegraph two thousand five hundred years ago. Shankaran with the ha, that is nothing. We have excavated sites which are five to seven thousand years old and we found nothing. That means we had wireless <laughs> Because we are engaged in debates like this, we are not taking care of many immediate things that we need to take care of, how to keep our street clean, how to keep our city clean, how to see that everybody is fed well, you know. We are not taking care of this because we are a little in the wireless state. <laughs> Thank you very much <laughs> So being in a premier technological institute like this, which uh, hundreds of thousand students want to get into this institution and barely a couple of hundred or three or four hundred people are getting in, is it? Yes. Yes. So, uh, getting into a coveted place like that, uh, where even internationally the institution is recognized as one of the premier institutions, it's not tremendous. just in India. So when you're in a place like this, it's my wish and my blessing that uh, you must really acquire knowledge and knowledge is no good unless it is dispensed with love and compassion in the world. Just pure knowledge without love and compassion, without involvement in life around us can become a very cruel force. Technology is the best thing that's happened to us and the worst thing that's ever happened to us, unfortunately. You have to make sure that technology is the best thing that's happened to us in the coming generation. The previous generation, all of us have used technology in a negative way. Yes, we've made bombs, we've made pollution, we've made terrible things. It's for you to create a wonderful world with the knowledge that you're garnering here. Being here in this premier institution, do not forget, so many would like to be here, but you are here. Please make use of this and create something really fabulous for this world. Thank you very much.